one top that, right? That conversation. Um, I'm not going to even try. Uh, but I'm going to, there are a whole number of issues, right, that pop out um, that we can talk about. We'll see how many we get to. But the first I'd like to start with your personal histories, both you and Yuri's, right? And in some ways, um, you kind of represent this sort of opposite ways of coming into radical politics, right? You're sort of this example of someone who, there's, you're never too young to start, right? When you talk about being 11 and starting this reading group, interracial reading group, right? Um, and Yuri talks about how she was 40, right, before she becomes politicized, right? And so it's an example of someone that it's never too late to start as well, right? And so in thinking about that, um, I wanted to sort of go back to the last ending part of the film where you're both talking about rethinking what revolutionary politics is about is what it looks like, what kind of activities actually count for it. And, and I was wondering, um, so does a label like a revolutionary radical some, in some ways maybe discourage individuals from joining in, those who might be sympathetic, right? Or is there another, what are these other ways of perhaps thinking about um, politics? Well, I, I don't know, I, I like revolutionary. <laughs> Especially in this time. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, sometimes we, um, we try euphemisms and we assume that, uh, you know, perhaps we will attract more people if we're not so radical. Mm, right. uh, but most of the time that doesn't work. It doesn't work because people want to hear radical analysis. And I think this is why, you know, Yuri um, was such a major voice uh, of, of our time. Um, and I think that she had political instincts before she became involved. Uh, uh, even though she, in describing her trajectory, she sees you know, 40 uh, as the age, but I, I think that when she was in her 20s, uh, she was you know, already um, critical and already uh, political. But I think that especially now, given our current predicament uh, with, uh, uh, as you pointed out uh, yesterday, the current occupant of uh, <laughs> the White House, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, um, yeah, we have to find an alternative because uh, this is not going to work. This is not going to work. Yeah. Well, I remember in, in talking about my mother with you that you said politically sensitive, right? And that those are actually maybe if we thought of those, some of those kind of things that she probably wouldn't consider political as very radical things, right? Taking in homeless people and, and things. Um, but you, you also said that when we were talking about, uh, well, Ke I should tell you that Kevin was uh, one of my graduate students at UC Santa Cruz, and now he's a professor at Columbia. <laughs> um, and it was an absolute joy to work with him. Um, but you were talking about the fact that um, uh, immediately after 9-11, your mother was so prescient, she could already foresee uh, the ways in which uh, Muslims and people who appear to be Muslims would be treated. And that came from the experience of the camps. Uh, so to me, that's that's um, having real political impulses. And, you know, it's not about necessarily about being a member of an organization or knowing exactly how to formulate uh, a political line. It's about understanding that we can all come together and change the world. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, she would definitely be up for that. <laughs> um, I was also, the, one of the themes that comes up is the revolutionary role of women, 
right? And often um, not remembered, right? As you know, I mentioned, like, who remembers Lolita LeBron, right? Uh, who, met, who remembers, well, maybe people remember Fannie Lou Hamer here um, and people like that. But um, we can also see how women's issues, and we can trouble that term if you want, uh, are now, right, currently are foreseeing patriarchy in some ways back on its heels, right, with the Me Too movement and uh, Time's Up. Um, and again, the right Me Too started with the African-American woman, Tarana Burke, right? Um, and so we have that going on at, at the same time. Um, you know, I want to speak to that in this, the relationship between gendered sexual violence and state violence, right, that you talk about. And as was mentioned in the film, right, like the Korean comfort women, right, so-called comfort women. Exactly. Right, and how the state has perpetuated it, and not just, you know, just globally, right, has perpetuated violence against women, violence against refugees, right? We can think about the Rohingya refugees in Myanmar and Bangladesh today, right? And we can just list off all the places, right? All the places of conflict around the planet. Um, and that, as you talk about so, so much, that the prison has become the place where the nation and the state, right, nation state tries to solve it or disappear those problems, right? That they're also creating. Um, and also I was thinking about the way that violence itself. Yeah, let's, right, let's, is, let's talk a little bit about um, Yuri's mm. um, emphasis on the potential of women, and especially women of color. I, I often find myself um, uh, feeling sort of sad that she never got to experience this period, to see uh, the ways in which her, her work uh, has led to, to major changes. Uh, um, and, you know, oftentimes when one speaks about the Me Too movement, um, one forgets that, one forgets the role that women of color played. Uh, one forgets that uh, uh, someone like Rosa Parks who we all know as the woman who refused to move to the back of the bus, right? Uh, we don't know that she was um, um, what you might call a sex crimes investigator, that she investigated gang rapes by the Ku Klux Klan uh, in, in Montgomery and rural Alabama, yeah. uh, on behalf of the NAACP in the 1940s. So. Right, right. And the domestic workers behind, right, the Montgomery bus boycott. Right. Uh, well, you know, women have always been the ones who organize <laughs> movements. I'm sorry, but... Uh, people aren't even aware of the fact that the majority of the members of the Black Panther Party were women. They were the ones who kept the movement going. Uh, and of course the civil rights movement before that. If it had not been for the women and um, for uh, women who were domestic workers, who were maids. Uh, yeah. And you know, oftentimes we don't, we don't think seriously enough about the collective part that um, people like the domestic workers in Montgomery played. Um, the Montgomery bus boycott, which was successful in 1955, almost the entire year of 1955, would not have been successful if people and women had not refused to take the bus to work because those were the, the black people who took the bus mostly. They took the bus to go from you know, our neighborhoods over to the neighborhoods of the rich white folks to clean their houses and, and, and wash their dishes and, uh, you know, cook their food. Mm -hmm. And so that, that first catalyst for uh, change in the mid-20th century would never have happened. 
That's right. If it hadn't been for for those women, we have to figure out. I mean, I, I've always talked about this, and I and I and and it's still a challenge. We have to figure out how to honor those whose names we do not know. Uh, and the problem is most of the names are attached to men. Right. And I mean, it's great. Malcolm X was amazing, and, mm. we, and we, we need to honor him, but let's not forget that movements don't happen because of single individuals. Right. Right. Uh, you know, individuals can emerge as powerful spokespersons. That was the case with Dr. King. It was certainly the case with, with Malcolm X. Uh, but without the organizing, and the organizing is usually done by women. That's right. I mean, that's the gender division of labor right. in the movement. Right. Uh, it, without the organizing, it, it, it's not going to happen. Yeah, I mean, one wonders about those three chapters missing from the autobiography, right? Right, And right. what is that chapter on his sister about, right? Um, and I remember in one seminar where you had uh, Madonna Thunderhawk come and... She showed how actually they turned around that all those assumptions, right? Those gendered assumptions about who was actually politically active with AIM, uh, the American Indian Movement. And she told the story of how the FBI and the sheriffs and even the reporters would come to the encampments and immediately make beelines to the men. And as they were sort of busy with the men, the women would continue organizing. Right? And they kind of used the assumptions uh, against its endemic, just kept kind of organizing it. Um, because nobody would even thought they were the ones. Right? <clears throat> uh, so I wanted to touch on maybe some sort of extending some of the conversation and thinking, and I mentioned this yesterday too, sort of some of the recent change of perception among liberals, right? Uh, New York Times readers say, right? Um, so the opioid crisis, right, is seen as a social issue rather than a crime issue, right? The opioid crisis, right, is seen as a social issue more than as a crime issue and like the crack epidemic was, right, because it's racialized in a very different way, right? Um, and as I mentioned, right, suddenly because of the current resident <laughs> of the White House, um, we have liberals sort of championing the FBI now and the CIA uh, and the military as sort of these protectors of the rule of law. And at the same time, though, we're having also this shift in electoral politics, right? And, um, we have Bernie Sanders, who makes sort of socialism safe, right, a safe word. Um, <laughs> uh, people like Alexandria, right, um, Ocasio-Cortez, right, Rashida Tlaib, um, who, more women running for office, right, those sort of changes that are manifesting as well. Um, around gun violence, right, you have the, speaking of women again, you have Emma Gold Gonzalez, right, the young activist against uh, uh, gun violence. Socialism is mainstreamed, right? You have Andrew Gillum down in Florida, who's gonna, he's, one of his platforms is repeal of felon disenfranchisement law, right? Um, so I was wondering if you saw this as raising the possibilities for radical transformations, or is this merely uh, chipping away at the edges? Um, well, you know, I think that, um, I think that the, the, the role of movements, if one looks at uh, how movements create change, you know, change in, in the institutional structure, change in the discourses. Uh, um, it, it doesn't happen overnight. Um, although I, I, I must admit that um, when we began to talk about prison abolition, and people uh, assume that it, this was this absolutely insane idea. You can't be serious, you know, talking about prison abolition. This was, uh, you know, maybe 20 years ago. Um, 
It was actually quite remarkable that within a relatively short period of time, and I'm saying short, uh, 10, 15, 20 years, that uh, abolition has become a serious topic, that people are engaging with uh, the, the notion that we can't simply reform these institutions. We can't simply reform uh, prisons. We can't simply reform the police. You know, we can't simply, we can't simply try to weed out all of the bad seeds from the police. Because the structure itself is racist. Racism is embedded in the apparatus. And, and so it has taken us a long time to get to the point where this makes sense. And I'm talking about in terms of, um, popular understanding, a popular discourse. Uh, because there, as I said before, 20 years ago, we talked about abolition and it was like, are you serious? Abolition? Well, what are we going to do if there are no um, prisons? How, how will we feel secure and safe? Uh, how will we feel, how will we feel secure without police? But the thing is, Security that is guaranteed by violence is not security. It's just Absolutely. more violence. Right. It just replicates the opposite of, of security. So I think that, um, you know, maybe there's some changes in the liberal discourse, but what is most exciting to me is that people are beginning to um, imagine new forms of justice, uh, new forms of security. And this is, this is what young people are doing, the you know, Black Lives Matter movement, right. uh, uh, which uh, is still very much a powerful influence. Uh, you know, people often think, um, well, we don't hear that much from uh, Black Lives Matter right now. Uh, and so the movement must have uh, disappeared. But, you know, movements require reflection and organizing, and you're not always engaged in dramatic events out front. If you were always out there demonstrating, you would never have time to think about why you're demonstrating and what kind of world you want and what kind of changes you want. So I think that's the, to me, that's the most exciting development. Well, again, you're ahead of me, because <laughs> I was actually going to go there about prison abolition, right, and the reconceptualizing what justice is, right. Um, and I wanted to raise indigeneity a little bit, and one way here is I wanted to contrast, um, I've been doing some work on Hawaiian stuff, and uh, they have this concept called ho'oponopono, which means bringing it into balance, and they use it as a way of conflict resolution, right? And the terms that they use are, are uh, rest, restitu restitution and forgiveness, right, rather than punishment, uh, and justice as a form of revenge, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so it's a very different, so what if our political agenda then called for cooperation and dialogue and renewal, right, instead of punishment um, and retribution. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's what it's all about, to try to imagine um, ways of ad addressing all of the, the, the issues uh, we uh, face. Now, the, the most pandemic form of violence in the world is gender violence. And, and, and Yuri was really uh, prescient in, in talking about uh, the comfort women and the importance of uh, supporting their campaign for, um, for uh, reparations. Uh, but it's, it's, it's interesting that when we talk about violence, somehow um, we're ideologically prime uh, to think about uh, young black men shooting up a neighborhood or some, there's some image, right. you know, it's very racialized. We don't think about uh, the Brett Kavanaugh's 
right? The Donald Trumps, uh, who engage in this, this gender violence uh, as routine, as a matter of course. And, you know, what I appreciated so much about Yuri was that she always um, drew the connections. Uh, you know, she was not um, myopic. She didn't, uh, she, she, she was really active in the campaign to free political prisoners. And, and um, you know, I've said many times, I, I don't know anyone who wrote as many letters to people in prison as Yuri. You know, whenever I would see her and she would, you know, talk about who she was writing, I, I'd get really embarrassed because I didn't have the time to, you know, to respond to every single letter that I received from a prisoner. But she responded to every single letter a prisoner ever wrote to her. Um, and I think, I mean, I think that, uh, and I'll talk about the violence issue, but I just, you know, when I, when I think about Yuri, she's... Um, She's such a model uh, for the way we should be in the world. Uh, her politics, uh, it, it wasn't about towing a party line. Her politics came from her heart and, 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 and really wanting to change the world. And she believed that up until the time that she died. And you saw she was still out there speaking at rallies, you know, when she was in a wheelchair. And she was doing research. So, um, and I'll come back to the violence issue in a minute. But I just, I, I, while this is in my head, I just want to point out that, that um, uh, one of the very first times I heard Yuri speak, she had done all of these research, all of this research about various kinds of encounters between um, um, people of Africans and people of African descent and Asians. She was really interested in how those uh, connections, the, the sort of um, uh, connections that are never acknowledged, uh, you know, from Bandung on. Uh, uh, and um, yeah, she was, she was really an absolutely amazing uh, person. Now, the issue of the relationship between intimate violence and institutional violence, which is a, which is a feminist insight. And I think that what is very exciting to me about these new youth movements, and I guess, I guess you're a youth if you're under 30, although I've met a lot of people who identify with being a youth and they're well into their 40s. Uh, I guess then the older you get, uh, the older youth gets too. <laughs> uh, but um, but what, what I find so exciting about the ways, the, the, the feminist analyses uh, that they um, develop and the the connections, uh, the, un the insight that there is a relationship between violence that happens in intimate relationships and violence that happens in prisons and violence that is, is perpetrated by the military or by the police. Uh, and in a sense, I was talking about this in your class yesterday, it's, you know, it's almost as if um, men get publicly punished, all the women do as well, but then the, the men are delegated to punish women in more private spaces. Uh, so a lot of that violence happens in inside relationships, uh, inside relationships that are supposed to be about love. Uh, uh, and if we can't figure out how to deal with that, uh, we'll never be able to imagine uh, a world where people, where human beings can uh, be healthy and, 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 and happy. Yeah. Um.
Yeah, I, that actually um, raises for me the other thing that comes up is those connections that you say, and like Yuri was phenomenal at sort of getting at, and um, so you know the Afro-Asian, Afro-Latin, um, uh, and all the various uh, kinds of connections one can make, right? And all all those different histories and different oppressions, but shared in some ways, and. Well, keeping in mind all those distinctions um, and differences, I was wondering to speak to some of the last um, um, part of the conversation you have with Yuri in the film. How do we sort of raise empathy uh -huh. across right. those differences, right? Across those different kinds of histories and recognize each other as human and sharing in both oppression and also the all the good human qualities we share, right? Well, I think she was a real model for that. Uh, um, and I think I was saying, and by the way, those conversations took place over a decade, I think. Uh, at least over a decade. Um, because the filmmakers, um, HQ and Crystal Griffith, um, came up with this idea and they did the first interview in Santa Barbara years ago and then several years later they said I think we need to do more interviews uh, and then five years later they said well we really need to do more and so <laughs> so um, it, 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 it represents a, a range of, 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 of different uh, moments uh, historical moments um, um, but I, th I think that, um, that Yuri was really a model of what, of, of what we might think about uh, when we imagine the kind of political activism that engages people not only in terms of what they think, their minds, their analysis, but also their emotions. And, 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 and their heart. Uh, um, you know, Yuri, Yuri really loved, you know, all of the prisoners that she wrote. And she really felt so strongly about Mumia Abu-Jamal, who is, by the way, still in prison. And we still need that movement she was talking about to guarantee that he can uh, come home. Um, um, I think it may also have to do with uh, the fact that as a consequence of, of the ravages of capitalism um, and neoliberal discourse, uh, uh, we are encouraged to imagine ourselves as individuals, uh, as solitary individuals and not in relation to community, not as people who are actually produced by our collective surroundings. Uh, and, and, that, and, 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 and those collectives are not simply um, geographically defined uh, communities. Right. Uh, they're communities that uh, uh, include people all over the world in 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 Africa in Latin America in in in, in Asia right. in the Middle right. East and and I would say that right now what I find really exciting is the way in which the in, in which black movements have taken up the issue of Palestine mm, yes. uh, yes. and and, 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 and it's, not because, it's not because we simply feel we are obligated to offer solidarity to a people struggling uh, across the ocean, but it, it's because there's this, there's this deep connection between the Palestinian struggle and the, the black struggle. For one, you know, black people, black people have been struggling Black people in the U.S. or in the Western Hemisphere have been struggling for freedom for how many years? For how many decades? 
for how many centuries? And, and we still haven't given up. I mean, that's actually quite remarkable that we're still, we're, we're, we're still um, engaged in liberation struggles. And Palestinian people have been struggling for right. decades and decades and centuries if you go all the way back. Uh, but, but at least since, the, um, since Israel was established in 1948 and they com uh, their, uh, their homes uh, were completely um, taken away from them, the evictions and, 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 and the fact that the vast majority of Palestinians were forced outside of uh, the, um, the borders of, of Palestine. So it's really wonderful to see all of these uh, connections. I know that Yuri would be very happy uh, because she was always about you know, making connections uh, between people of, 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 of various cultures and ethnicities and various um, racial backgrounds. And she demonstrates that that black movements, when you say black movements, you're not only talking about black people. You know? For one thing, for one thing, not all black people are embraced by those movements because there are black people who have been on the other side. Um, you know, we've been hearing a lot about Clarence Thomas these days. Right. Uh, yeah. and, 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 and so I think it's so important for us to think about black movements in this capacious way. Uh, yes. The black radical tradition. Um, it's a tradition of black, radical, black, you know, cultural, political activism, but many other people have participated in it. Uh, the filmmaker, um, um, Helen Kwan and, and Crystal Griffin. H Helen Kwan is a Chinese American woman who uh, uh, was trained by uh, Cedric Robinson, who is, uh, was an uh, amazing, um, you know, political scientist and theorist uh, of, of emancipation. He wrote his most well-known book is Black Marxism. And so Helen, well, I always call her HQ, Helen Kwong, but she goes by HQ. Uh, she, she always points out that um, when she's speaking to young um, Asian American women activists, she tries to point out how important the black radical tradition has been for everyone. And, and how that is the tradition in this country that has never given up on freedom, that has never given up on justice, that has never given up on equality. Uh, um, and I should also say that uh, indigenous people, n native people who uh, have been struggling longer than anyone else. Uh, uh, all the rest, all of us are immigrants, forced immigrants or not, except for indigenous people. That's right. Um, yeah, and I just wanted to mention that, you know, the Palestinian grassroots organizing is women too, right? It's the grandmothers and the mothers and the sisters and the aunties um, that are organizing there too. Okay, so I'm noticing. Um, I promised I some... <laughs> promised uh, some of my students a chance to ask some questions and then um, sort of opening it up to everybody. Um, so, the first questioner, and you can introduce yourself. Hi, so I'm Brendan. Um, yes, we met last night. It's good to see you met again. You last night. <laughs> yes, you look lovely. Um, so, uh, Dr. Phyllis has already asked all of my questions, so this one I just kind of came up with. So, if it um, if it sounds kind of on the off the cuff, please forgive me. So, in the documentary, um, Mrs. Yuri, she mentions that truth is the most powerful weapon uh, for women of color that they can use utilize in a movement. 
And so my question is, how do we build movements around the truths of women of color, specifically their organizing power and the violence that they face, um, especially when these truths are often erased? And you mentioned when you talked about the Me Too movement and the erasure of Tarana Burke and the erasure of the violence that women in prison, uh, women in prison face, specifically black women in prison, I would say. Um, so how do we utilize these truths to build movements that help us create a world that center um, women of color in, in the future? Um, yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Thank you. And I, I think I may have said something like this in class uh, yesterday evening, um, but the erasure of the contributions that women of color have made to feminist movements uh, has led to um, a sense of, 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 of feminism as being, um, first of all, white. I mean, many people are even afraid to identify with feminism because who do they think about? They think about Hillary Clinton, right? And, and, and they're, they're and of course she's a feminist, but not the kind of feminist I identify with, right? So we're talking about a feminism that is anti-racist, that is anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist, and, and so I, I think that um, when one looks, for example, at the campaigns against sexual violence that have been organized by women of color, they look very different. Uh, Yuri was referring to the campaigns for reparation for the so-called comfort women um, in um, Korea. We can think about campaigns um, against, I spoke about um, Rosa Parks and the campaigns against sexual violence inflicted by the Ku Klux Klan, like gang rapes on black women, um, sexual violence during slavery. We know that slavery was saturated with gender violence. And, and therefore the, 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 the message is that there's something institutional about it. It's not just about bad men attacking women, which is how it looks uh, when it gets represented you know, outside of the context of, uh, of understanding racism and, 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 and class bias. Uh, um, and somehow or another, it gets reduced to pinpointing those individual men who engage in acts of sexual violence, not realizing that you can, you know, you can send Bill Cosby to jail, um, but that's not going to solve the problem. I mean, I'm not saying that, 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 that perpetrators of gender violence shouldn't be uh, rendered accountable, but we should not be satisfied with simply sending someone to jail. Because prisons are very violent institutions. And so these violent people go into violent prisons and the violence gets reproduced and increased and that has an impact on the larger society. The point that I'm making is that if we, if we think about the ways in which women of color have conducted campaigns against gender violence, um, we understand that it has to include um, an awareness of the institutional, uh, the structural character of that violence. Uh, you know, I was thinking about the, that, that Dr. Larry Nasser, who uh, sexually abused all of those, uh, those Olympic gymnasts, uh, hundreds, hundreds. 
And he didn't do it just because he was a, a bad man, which he is. But he had help. He had help. You know, because many of those girls talked about what the doctor was doing and nobody believed them. And they said, oh, you know, that's just a form of treatment. He's a prominent doctor, the same kind of thing that Donald Trump says about Brett Kavanaugh. That's right, yeah. So I'm, what I'm saying is we would have a very different approach if we took you know, all of the, what, what, what's often called intersectionality, if we developed an intersectional analysis. Right. So the next. Yeah. Hi again, Wait, Professor. Does that make sense? Where is it? Does that make sense? Oh, yes. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I just wanted to make sure I answered your question. Um, hi again, Professor Davis. I'm Esperanza. Um, actually, this is a really good segue to my question. Um, it circulates around the issue of feminism. Um, I guess my question is mainly, how do we apply, because often unintentionally sometimes the issues of women of color get pushed aside when, it, when we talk about feminism and social justice. So. How do you see that um, kind of happening today? And in what ways can we collaborate and mirror the type of collaboration that we saw in the video um, to apply to today's movements? Well, you know, first of all, I think it's important to uh, um, remember that many of these issues have been uh, reconceptualized and reframed as a result of the work of women of color. Um, and so we can't simply be critical of white feminism. Um, we have to take the leadership. The, the women's march that happened, do you remember the women's march that happened after who was elected? Uh, I mean, that was less than two years ago. And that, that, that was a perfect example of how uh, women of color can assume the leadership. The idea was created by um, one white woman who got in touch with another one. And then, <laughs> then eventually, um, uh, a, a number of the women of color, you know, including Linda Sarsour, who was a you know Palestinian American woman, black women, said that white women cannot represent all women. You know, even in the way we think about gender, gender has been racialized. So when you use the category women it automatically refers to white women. And that's something really wrong about that. That is not right. White women are in the minority in the world. <laughs> but this is, I mean, this is how racism works. And it's, a, it's as important for people of color as it is for white people to understand the impact of, 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 of that discursive racism. And, and so uh, a, a steering committee was created uh, that consisted of uh, a large number of women of color and it completely transformed the organizing and the issues that were raised at the, the, the Women's March. Um, you see, um, I mean, I'm not saying that white women don't play an important role. Uh, you saw pictures of Anne Braden. I don't know if any of you are uh, familiar with Anne Braden, but she was one of my mentors, a white woman born in the South who uh, stood up to the racists in the South at a time when no other white people were doing it. And as a matter of fact, she and her husband, Carl, they were connected to the uh, family I lived with, it was a section of the film that talked about me living in, in a bedside with this white family. Uh, uh, it, it, 
uh, Reverend Mellish created this organization called the Southern um, Conference Educational Fund, SCEF, and Anne Braden and her husband, Carl, were a part of it. But Anne and Carl bought a home and turned it in a segregated, in a white community, and turned it over to black people. And Carl ended up being sentenced to the federal penitentiary for doing that. Uh, so so I'm, and what I'm suggesting is that we have to be really conscious about the way in which racism has shaped our, our lives and the fact that, uh, uh, that white people often assume that because they're white, they know better. And people in this country, U.S. people, often assume in relation to the rest of the world that because we are from the United States of America, somehow we know better than other people in the world and that we have nothing to learn from people in Africa and in Latin America. And so I, I think that kind of, that kind of um, consciousness is always important. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, the ways in which issues have been formulated within an intersectional context in relation to um, structures and institutions as well as in relation to our personal lives, that insight, that feminist insight has come from women of color. Well, I see that we have run out of time, actually. Um, and, but that was a, a beautiful way to end it, I think. <laughs> um, to think about right, shaping and reshaping um, how we think about a radical transformation and radical politics. Well, let me just say one thing, Kevin, uh, because I didn't realize that was the last question now. Um, I think it's really important to look to other countries. And, you know, for example, in Brazil, the black women's movement in Brazil is the most vibrant movement in that country. And uh, in the aftermath of uh, the, the coup that uh, kicked uh, Dilma uh, Rousseff out of office, uh, that black women's movement really represents the future of Brazil. And I'm not sure, do you all uh, know Marielle Franco? Any of you know Marielle Franco, um, who was um, assassinated uh, um, about, well, not uh, quite a year ago, in March, I think, of last year. And she was this amazing organizer uh, who organized in black communities and LGBTQ communities. And so, and this is getting back to your question about empathy. We have to be attentive to what's going on in other parts of the world. And we have to express solidarity and stand up and stand with our sisters and brothers and comrades. Uh, um, because if we try to do it alone, believe me, uh, you see what happens when we try to do it alone in the U.S. You see uh, which in which political direction the country begins to, to lead. So, um, yeah. And I, I, I'm, um, I think we have to make sure that Donald Trump does not serve out his uh, four year term. I mean, that's, that should be a major goal. Yes, yeah. And so if we have to go out in the street, do whatever we can, artists need to get involved, everybody gets, everybody who has anything to contribute, and that is literally everyone, That's has right. to ask themselves, how can, this is what Yuri did, how can I make uh, my talents um, relevant to uh, uh, changing the world? What, what do I have to offer? And I think if we do that, then there may be some, some hope for the country and the world. Yes, and one way of doing that is I'm um, reading her memoirs, passing it on, right? Where it's labeled a memoir, but it's really a recipe for thinking radically 
and thinking revolutionary. So, um, <laughs> thank you very you. much, everyone. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you.